You guys can see that. Uh, let me stop for a second. I am going to share the sound. Welcome everyone. You're at the Level Up series and we're gonna get started in about five minutes.
Welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Level Up series. We're just a few minutes from starting. Welcome everyone. It is now three o'clock. And so we're ready to start our level up series for this afternoon. So today we have adapting your garden and landscape for climate change with Weston Miller. And um, so I wanna welcome everyone. My name is Heather Stoven. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the extension horticulturist in Yamhill County, Oregon. And I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. Yamhill County, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, the Kalapuya were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, the living descendants are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz. Thank you for coming today to this Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up session. The series has been produced by Oregon State University Extension Master Gardener Program and has been organized and led by a group of Master Gardener coordinators, OSU faculty and staff from across the state. The OSU Extension Master Gardener Program educates Oregonians about the art and science of growing and caring for plants. We're in 27 counties across the straight state and train thousands of Oregon Master Gardener volunteers. OSU Extension Master Gardeners are extension educators, <clears throat> neighbors, and on-the-ground researchers who see, serve their community with solid training in science-based sustainable gardening and a love of lifelong learning. If you're a Master Gardener volunteer, thank you for dedicating your time and knowledge. If you're not a Master Gardener, but are interested in becoming one, in Oregon, we'll be hosting training for new volunteers in 2022. You can learn more about the program and about other workshops in this series on our website. Today's workshop is being recorded and will be accessible to view along with all the presentations in the series on our site. And we'll put a chat, a link in the chat box for you to see where the recordings will be. So some general housekeeping. Um, so for the tools in Zoom, um, we do have closed captioning enabled for this particular webinar. So if you're interested in looking at the closed, closed captioning, you can choose the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen um, so you can see it while we're presenting. The um, recordings will also have closed captioning at the end as well. 
Um, participants are all muted. Please use the Q&A for your questions, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the upvote button for Q&A to move a question to the top of the list if it's a question that you also have and are interested in it. We will have five minutes for questions in the middle of Weston's presentation, and then five minutes for questions again at the end of the presentation. There's also a group of us that are assisting with questions during the presentation during the, due to the high volume of participant questions. We also have approval for one Oregon Landscape Contractors Board credit for watching this webinar. So please contact me, Heather Stoven, at heather.stoven at oregonstate.edu if you're interested and licensed with the board and want to receive credit. At the end of the presentation, we'll host, post an evaluation in the chat box for this webinar for um, Weston's evaluation. And that um, is going to be put here into the chat box in just a moment. And then there's also going to be a second evaluation for the entire series that are going to be for the committee to use. So that will come at the end of the presentation as a pop up and then it'll also be in your email. So please fill out both of those evaluations. It's very important for both Weston and our committee to be able to improve this series. So our talk today is adapting your garden and landscape for climate change. It'll be taught by Weston Miller. He is a community and urban horticulturist for the OSU Extension Service. Service. He manages the OSU Master Gardener program in the Portland metro area and works with Metro to reduce residential pesticide use. He also manages the Beginning Urban Farmer Apprenticeship Program in cooperation with Multnomah County. The area, which is now Portland metro area, is the traditional lands of the Cowlitz Multnomah, Kathalamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Wasco, Malala, what's, what Lala, bands of the Chinook, and many other nations that made their homes along the Columbia for both permanent and seasonal encampments. Today, people from these bands have become both the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, as well as the Chinook Nation and Cowlitz Nation in Washington State. So with that, I would like to hand this over to Weston and you can share your screen. And thank you very much for um, being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Heather. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this webinar and thank you, Heather, for the land acknowledgement. I'm gonna share my screen here. Give me one moment. All righty, you should be able to see my screen. Today's presentation, uh, let, me, let me just start by saying I'm Weston Miller. I do manage the Master Gardener program here in the Portland Metro area. I go by he, him pronouns. This afternoon's presentation is an, on adopting your yard and garden for climate change. Definitely post your questions in the Q&A. We'll have two chances to um, to uh, ask, or, or excuse me, to answer the questions uh, in the middle of the presentation and towards the end. And here we go. Um, also, we're gonna launch a poll right now, if we could. Um, so the question is, are you actively preparing your yard and garden for climate change? Answer is yes, no, or I don't know. I'm curious to see how people land on this. Gonna give it a moment here. We have 419, 420 people on call. And it looks like about 64% um, or more have uh, started to prepare their yards for climate change. Um, 56 or so have not and about 74 have not. So that gives me a great sense that y'all are aware of climate change and aware that it's impacting your yard. I think we're, we're seeing lots of evidence of it and that you're actively um, taking steps to adapt your yard for, the, for climate change. So good job on that as I go through the presentation. Hopefully I'll uh, affirm many of, of the uh, steps that you're already taking and also hopefully give you some new ideas as well. And I'm going to share the results right now. So 65% yes, 15% uh, no, and 20% I don't know. Are you actively preparing your yard and garden for climate change? So thanks for much, so much for responding to the poll. 
Here's a preview of what we're gonna be talking about. The historical climate for the Pacific Northwest. The evidence about climate change is clear. We'll talk about some examples of that. Uh, what we should expect in the future. And most importantly, I think for you all, what's a gardener and a landscaper to do? And also mention a couple OSU programs that are thinking of, actively thinking about climate change and coming up with uh, ways to respond. Let's start with a, a definition here, or two definitions, uh, weather versus climate. Weather is the short term uh, minutes, a month measure of temperature, humidity, precipitation, wind, air pressure. And climate change is the average weather over longer periods of time, years, decades, and centuries. Um, so weather is moment by moment. Climate is a longer term uh, situation. And just thinking about the historical climate for the maritime Pacific Northwest, um, the map here shows various regions of the world that all have similar climates. Uh, it's termed the Mediterranean type climate. It's characterized by mild, wet winters and warm, dry summers. And it turns out that uh, plants that are native to here are accustomed to those conditions and that it also behooves us to choose plants from different areas of the world. So native plants to the Pacific Northwest, also plants from the Mediterranean region, from um, South, South America along the coast of Chile, um, the uh, tip of South, uh, excuse me, of Africa, and then areas of, of Australia. All those zones have similar climates to ours. So presumably the plants that are from those zones can handle warm, dry summers and mild, wet winters. Really important to point out that drought happens. Um, it happens seasonally. We know that we have dry season every year during the summertime. It happens regionally. Right about now, the, the sort of the extended drought that's happening is worse in southern Oregon and California than it is the northern part of the state. Um, it happens periodically. So if you look back at tree rings or other evidence, um, you know through time uh, there are dry periods and there are more wet periods. And then it's definitely safe to say that at this point, pretty much the entire Western US is in an extended period of drought. And you can see the super sad uh, rhododendron here, um, a product of very, very dry soils. And then that hot, hot weather we had this summer. Um, before we launch into uh, sort of the impact of climate change, it's also important just to think about cold hardiness. Uh, cold, cold hardiness is the measure of how uh, cold your, your different plants can get. And I'm going to give you reference to the Portland metro area where I'm coming from uh, using the USDA hardiness zone. I'm in zone 8A, 8B. And what that means is that we can expect lows from 10 to 20 degrees. Doesn't mean that's going to happen every year necessarily, but you can expect maybe once or twice a decade or so, we're going to get really low temperatures. And then if we're investing in plants for our garden and landscape, then we really want to think about choosing plants that will handle those low temperatures or at least be willing to replace plants when they do get cold damage. I also want to point out that the, the, um, the Sunset Western Garden Book has some additional zonation that's important. So for me, the more information I can gather about my general climate, the better. And what Sunset Western Garden says about the area where I live, the Willamette and Columbia River Valleys, growing season about 280 days, 40 to 55 inches of precipitation a year, 10 year extreme lows, again, in that range of zero to 10 degrees or so. So that's useful information if you're choosing plants. And then it's also really critical that you understand the microclimate of your area. And microclimate is determined by where you are geographically, um, are you on a, a mountain? Are you on the, the south side of that and getting a lot of sun? Are you on the north side of that mountain? Um, also, just in terms of buildings, um, if the sun is uh, sort of at high noon during the middle of the summer, the south part of your property is going to be really hot, and a lot of reflective heat from the house and so on. 
And then um, in an ideal world, uh, you can place trees along the, the west side of your property to help to shade your house, to uh, reduce your heating bills and so on. So microclimate is very specific to your location, to the trees, to the buildings that are all there right around your garden or your structure. Do you wanna point out that if you're interested in learning about your microclimate, I highly recommend that you check out a publication called How to Determine Your Garden Microclimate. It's from Washington State University. And if you look up that key term, um, how to determine your microclimate, you'll find it. And it gives you lots of really good information about how to analyze your own site to think about the influence of where your site is and how it's positioned with, with relation to the sun and, uh, and objects and things like that. Just a couple more things. Um, I'm thinking about the climate of my area, which is, is Portland. Um, here we are, uh, the Columbia River Gorge is to the east. And uh, during the winter time, there are times when cold air flows in from the interior all, as far east as Idaho and Montana, um, British Columbia flows down the Columbia River and out into the, the upper part of the Willamette Valley here. So that can lead to some interesting things. So some sort of rapid temperature changes. Um, it can also lead to um, strong winds, cold temperatures, freezing rain. Um, in the last couple of years, definitely thinking about numerous times when there's been freezing range kind of in the eastern part of the metro area and into to the gorge due to this cold flow of air from the interior. Also, um, urban heat island is an important concept for you to understand. And this is the north part of Portland where the Willamette and the Columbia rivers flow together. And this chart shows the Portland heat islands. The reddish colors are warmer than the bluish colors. So it turns out that the areas up along the Columbia where there's lots and lots of concrete, the industrial area, uh, that area is an urban heat island. And the areas more on the left-hand side of the map where the blue is, that's forest park. So the trees are leading to evaporative cooling and shading and so on. So depending on where you are and what's around you, if you're living in a city or a town and there's a big parking lot near you and a bunch of buildings, then it's likely to be a little bit warmer than the surrounding area around you. Next topic is talking about uh, the evidence about of climate change being super clear. And uh, what I really urge you, you to do is to check out the National Climate Assessment. And they have a whole chapter on the Pacific Northwest that goes into details about the kinds of changes that we're already seeing here in the Northwest um, from climate change. And uh, let's just say that um, in the mass media, there's still some talk about uh, like questioning the effects of climate change and the Earth's temperatures. And let's just say that scientists agree that the Earth's temperatures is changing and that it's going up. So this data shows that there's um, from NASA, from the National N NOAA, NOAA, and from the Japanese Meteorological Agency, all of those agencies are collecting data on temperature, and all of them are showing that since the early 1900s, the temperature has risen um, close to one degree globally, basically, and that that's going to have some impacts on our life here in the Pacific Northwest. What can we expect in the future? Uh, well, if I had a crystal ball, what I would tell you is that we, we can expect that the frequency and intensity of extreme weather will increase. So remember that weather is sort of um, short-term events. Again, the frequency and intensity of extreme weather is gonna increase. Gonna give you some examples. Um, what one thing we can expect is aberrant freezing and snow patterns. So both early and late in the season, and especially for evergreen shrubs, that leads to problems with snow load on, on vulnerable plants, or if trees haven't lost their leaves yet in the fall, um, that could lead to damage. It also is gonna be a challenge for early and late flowering fruiting varieties, or uh, it's just gonna make those plants harder to grow. 
then also expect more events of freezing rain. And that's happened at least a couple times the last number of years. And it turns out that if you have large trees in your landscape, they're gonna be susceptible to damage from freezing rain. And um, it's gonna be something that you're gonna need to deal with. For example, when a tree on your property falls across a road, it's your responsibility to get that cleared as soon as possible. Another thing that we can expect is that there is going to be wind gusts and that they damage trees. And uh, this is looking from the street at my house in southwest Portland um, to the south, basically. And that stand of Douglas firs are standing kind of to the southeast of my home. That that makes me really nervous because I know that storm winds circle around counterclockwise in, in uh, low pressure zones and the winds come kind of whipping around from the southeast and um, as a result one of the major steps that I personally have taken on my property to get my get ready for climate change to adapt my yard is to thin out these trees a little bit to decrease the sail effect or the drag of the wind um, as it's whipping around during storms. And there definitely have been a lot of wind storms, both during uh, like rainstorms, but also just windy weather over the last couple years. And here's just a couple of examples from my neighborhood walking around after the fact. And then uh, back to my own property, just last January, we had one of those large fir trees break and fall. And this is even after I went and had my arborist do some thinning of the tree to try to decrease the wind drag effect. Um, the tree had a, a split leader. So there were two leaders. Uh, the arborist cabled those together in hopes of sort of um, ameliorating the damage or, or decreasing the likelihood that it was going to split. And uh, it turns out that the, the wind was strong and it knocked the whole thing off, bringing off both of these leaders. Um, fortunately, I'm friends with my arborist and he was able to come out the next day and help to clean this up um, so that the, the street was clear. Uh, that's a relationship that I've developed over years because I have trees on my property. I know that, that having an arborist who's gonna answer my call and come over uh, quickly is really important for me. Um, fire preparedness is a whole nother presentation. I recommend that you consider um, the situation on your property with regards to fire preparedness. OSU does have a great publication on this. It's called uh, Fire Resistant Plants for Home Landscapes. That would be a really good starting place for you to start thinking about how to minimize the risk of fire damage from your landscape on your property. A couple more things that we, we know that we're going to see, and that is extended drought. Um, our, the reservoirs around the region are, are getting really low. This last weekend, I just drove to California and back, and Lake Shasta down in Northern California looked really, really sad and low. The photo here shows Detroit Lake a couple years back. Um, so if there's less precipitation, there's less um, snow, there's less uh, water running into our region's lakes and reservoirs. Uh, along with that, if there are warmer temperatures, that also favors algae blooms. So one really sad thing about um, the warmer temperatures is that it leads to these blooms of, of toxic algae. The algae is really actively toxic to dogs. Um, you don't want to swim in it yourself when there are um, warnings about algae blooms. So I would just say pay attention in your recreation about algae blooms and uh, take it seriously because you don't want your dog to drink that water and die, and it's pretty darn gross. And then of course, there's wildfire smoke. Um, the last number of years have been pretty rough with regards to wildfire smoke in various parts of the state, um, several days at a time, several weeks at a time, and so on. All of these are symptoms of climate change occurring in our area. And then this last year, June 2021, we had that heat dome that occurred. Um, so it got awfully hot here in the Portland metro area, somewhere around 113 degrees or so. And these plants here definitely did not fare all that well. Um, on the left-hand side, 
um, Burgundia, just kind of toasted on the right hand side and ornamental landscape um, conifer. This is the south side, west side of the tree facing some more, more concrete. You can see is just absolutely torch chair. The good news is that these plants aren't dead. They're gonna survive, but they definitely are looking a little bit worse for wear. Uh, the evergreen will lose its needles this year and might green up again next year. Hopefully no major dead branches. And then here's just a couple more witness uh, pictures of plants around the area that really didn't fare very well. Um, I noticed that it was especially plants that were facing east and especially plants that were near concrete. Because remember, concrete and asphalt um, retains heat and then gives it off over time. And the whole area is just a little bit hotter than surrounding um, locations. One um, really unfortunate impact of the long-term drought that we're experiencing is that Douglas firs up and down the Willamette Valley and beyond are really suffering. Um, so trees that started 20, 25 years ago, accustomed to a certain climate, um, just in the last number of years have really started to fade. And then I would also say that in my neighborhood, I've noticed that an awful lot of Western red cedar is dying and not looking so hot either. So these trees, uh, both dead, it's just long-term drought and the soil is just too dry for these plants that love to grow in um, sort of riparian zones where there's lots of water. They're just not faring well outside of that habitat at this point in time, at least here in the Portland metro area. A Couple other impacts that we can probably uh, predict with regards to higher temperatures. And that is that uh, warmer temperatures boost insect activity. So, uh, insects depend on just the ambient temperature to um, sort of regulate their life processes. The warmer it, it gets in the spring, the earlier the insects wake up and start their life cycle, potentially leading to an additional life cycle or so during the course of the growing season. So we know that um, with insect activity, there's also going to be damage to the plants that we like to grow. And uh, it's safe to say that pest problems happen. Uh, this is the brown marmorated stink bug, which is a relatively new pest here to, uh, to Oregon. You can see it's established up and down Western Oregon, up and down the I-5 corridor, also going out into Eastern Oregon as well. So if um, we have more insects being introduced to our area that are pests, and it, there are warmer temperatures, that really um, spells sort of trouble for us in terms of trying to manage insects and pests on our plants. I will say that there's some good news about the brown marmorated stink bug. And that is um, when they came in, uh, also with them came the samurai fly. And the samurai fly is the natural enemy of brown marmorated stink bug in its, uh, its, its native home in, in Japan. So the samurai wasp, it's, from what I can tell anecdotally and what I've heard from OSU's researchers is starting to uh, basically, uh, the wasp lays its eggs inside the BMSB eggs. The, the larva sort of squirm through, they eat the contents and then the adult wasp emerge, uh, thereby killing the eggs. And apparently there's starting to be an effect of the samurai wasp helping to uh, minimize BMSB populations a bit. And there's just uh, these days, uh, every year or so, we get a new introduced pest that comes to our area. Um, this is a photo of the damage from Azalea lace bug five, six years ago. It wasn't really even here in Oregon in the Willamette Valley. Now it's a very common pest and particularly azaleas and rhododendrons. They used to be sort of um, staple landscape crops for the Willamette Valley. These days they're getting much, much harder to grow due to this pest. How climate change is helping invasive species take over? Well, longer growing seasons and warmer temperatures uh, favor weeds quite a bit. So for example, purple loosestrife, which is a weed uh, here along river, uh, rivers and creeks um, blooming earlier than it did. Um, so longer growing season, 
um, blooming earlier, flowering earlier, all these are challenges if you're a person who manages weeds on your property. And also it's important to point out that just along with an invasive insects, there are also increasing diversity and abundance of invasive weeds. That's not a direct result of climate change per se, but it's a, 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 a result of uh, people moving soil and plants around. And you can tell how I feel about lesser helandine. It's a really nasty weed that spreads by little tubers in the ground. Um, I've seen a couple community gardens here in the Portland area where lesser celandine is really rampant and there's really no good ways to control it. Even with herbicides, um, short of digging and sifting all of these little bulbets out of the soil, very, very, very difficult to control. So what this tells us that overall, climate change could alter weed proliferation, meaning where they grow, and competitive behavior in weedy vegetation, in crop areas, and, and maintain landscapes. We can expect that there's gonna be a change in, of where weeds grow in terms of latitude, and also elevation, and a change in phenology, meaning the annual life cycle. So all of this is uh, so much to say that weeds, uh, might become a little bit more aggressive and more difficult to deal with is, as if they're not already hard enough. So now's a good time to take some questions. Heather, if you could um, call a couple out for me, that would be awesome. Sure. So we have one here that has been very popular. So I'll start out with this one. It's from Kevin. How has the change in climate affected Japanese maple trees? Any additional care we should provide them? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have seen um, landscape maples, let's just say, um, suffering from drought stress. And what I would do personally is water them more. Uh, so next summer, uh, set up a soaker hose around them or another way to really get some deep watering. And every couple of weeks, give it an awful lot of water. And that's going to help them to handle those higher temperature spikes, but also just the drier, longer summers that we seem to be having. Um, so um, ample, if not more irrigation. And then uh, I guess the caveat of that is that at the same time, we know that if, if not now in the near future, we might face water shortages. So if that's the case, um, if you have your Japanese maples, I would say keep them and take care of them. If you haven't already planted them, I would question whether or not you want to plant trees and shrubs that really require lots and lots of water to, to keep looking good. How about another, Heather? Yeah, perfect. And with this is a good segue into the next question. If you had to pick the top three perennials or top three drought tolerant perennials for the Portland area, what would they be? Sure, I saw that question before and I wrote a couple down. Um, I would say yarrow. Yarrow is one of my favorite, very, very durable, easy to grow natives. Um, Douglas Aster would be another native, very easy to grow, um, spreading type plant. And then um, I would lean on um, a lot of the plants from the Mediterranean region, for example, in, in, the, in the, excuse me, in the mint family. So lavender, rose, rosemary, perovskia, um, those are all really drought resistant and in fact don't like it if you water them in the summer. Um, also rock rose would be another good choice for you um, for perennial non-woody type plants to grow um, in our area. Perfect, so we have time for one or two more. You had mentioned earlier that our heat wave damaged plants that were facing east and the question was why, is, mm, I, why it, was that? Um, I think I said there the the sides of the plants facing west um, had the most damage. If I said east, that was my bad. Um, the reason the west side of plants experienced the most damage is because the afternoon sun is in the the west and to the south a little bit, and um, though that in the afternoon is when it's hottest, and that's where the air uh, basically and the the heat the the sun itself are going to damage the plant the most. Okay, perfect. That makes sense. Um, so then the next, I mean, this is the last question I'm going to um, answer or have okay. asked you, and then we'll move on. Should we, is from Barbara, should we plant native plants from California and Mexico then? That's a great question, Barbara. Um, I really appreciate that. So the idea is that um, 
if we know it's getting hotter and it's already uh, the climate in California and further south is hotter traditionally, should, should we potentially use plants from those regions here? And I would say that might be a good way to hedge your bets. So if you're going to be planting new plants, I would research drought hardiness as a very, uh, like one of the first criteria along with cold hardiness. Um, those are the two things that you need to balance. So typically the plants from California are gonna be less cold hardy, but they're gonna be more drought hardy. We're still gonna expect some of those cold weather events here and there. Um, so for me, um, I've definitely planted a lot of California native plants, both in my yard and in the landscapes that I grow here. Ceanothus is one of my favorites. Um, it doesn't necessarily handle those 10 degree weather events very well. Um, so that's a balancing act that you're going to need to do. Um, but the more research you do and the, the more careful you are in choosing your plants, uh, the more info you'll have with regards to your investment. Okay, folks, well, thank you so much for all those questions. I really appreciate it. We'll get into some more questions towards the end of the presentation. All right, we're gonna shift gears and talk about, well, um, so climate change is happening and we know that it's affecting our plants. What can we do about it? And I'm gonna talk specifically about uh, putting carbon into the soil, both through uh, adding compost and improving soil conditions and also through mulch going to encourage you to do your research, um, choose drought hardy plants, how to get plants established. Um, even if you choose drought hardy plants, you need to water them to get them going through that first summer or more. Um, we'll talk a little bit about irrigation and then some other strategies to adapt for climate change. In terms of um, overall soil composition, so the soil that's out there in your yard, um, let's say that it had about 45% of it is the mineral component of it. So that's the, the ground up sand, silt, and clay. There's also going to be uh, about 25% of air and water, respectively. And somewhere about 5% of soil is organic matter. And that contains the roots of the plants, contains all those many, many microorganisms that are living there. And then it also is humus, which is sort of stabilized organic matter in the soil. Organic matter is really um, the most important thing about growing plants in a lot of ways is that if you add organic matter to the soil, it's going to um, help with long-term fertility. It's going to improve the quality of sandy soils or clay soils. It's going to break down over time to form the humus. And uh, when it does that, the microorganisms form this little glue, or a glue that's in the soil, causes those soil particles to stick together or aggregate. When that happens, it holds more air and water. Um, it kind of buffers the drying effect, uh, acts like a sponge, uh, makes it so that the roots can do respiration and do their, their processes. Organic matter is gonna help to improve the water holding capacity, um, it itself releases nutrients and also as uh, microbes break down the mineral component of the soil uh, with organic matter, that's going to release nutrients. Uh, it provides food for all the beneficial organisms in the soil. So adding organic matter is really one of the, the best things that you can do, um, both in terms of capturing carbon, but really specifically in terms of caring for your plants and getting them off to a good start. In soil, just a little tablespoon of soil, one gram of soil is gonna have up to a billion bacteria. These are microscopic, uh, up to a million actinomycetes, a million fungi, algae, 100,000, protozoans, 100,000, and nematodes. So all of these, um, the, the bacteria and the fungi specifically are breaking down the soil organic matter, forms a, a web of um, ecology that's happening there in your soil. And you don't need to know what they all are necessarily, but you should know that when you add organic matter to the soil, you're feeding this abundance of, of life. And um, this slide shows basically the arrangement of soil chunks and the organic matter. It's the glue that holds the, the particles together. Uh, soil particles are called PEDs. Uh, the, when you put organic matter in the soil, 
it causes the peds to aggregate or form bigger little chunks. When they form bigger chunks, that makes more poor spaces for air and water in the soil. Um, so the take home message is that organic matter feeds soil life and creates stronger and bigger soil peds, creating more space for air and water in the soil. Um, all of those are super beneficial in terms of roots penetrating the ground in order to grow and in terms of water filling the, uh, those spaces to, um, to uh, feed your plants and so on. I wanna point out that uh, with soil organic matter, different parts of it kind of have, have different lifespans. And if you think about all the carbon dioxide that's in the air, uh, one strategy that we can take is try to put organic matter in the soil. And then when it get, becomes stable, uh, then it lasts in the soil for long periods of time. So plant residues might last for about five years, uh, particulate organic matter about a hundred years, the microbes in the soil are going to uh, sort of cycle through in about three years, that carbon will. But humus, the ultimate stage of decomposition, uh, dominated by really stable compounds, that's going to last in the soil for 100 to 5,000 years. So one of the really specific and practical things that you can do as a gardener with regards to um, capturing carbon is to add organic matter in the soil and then to uh, to leave it there. Basically, don't till it, just let it all um, sort of lie. And then over time, it will form these more and more stable particles and stay in your soil for very long periods of time. This last bit of information, all of it, I got from the uh, NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They have an awesome web, uh, website called Soil Food Web. If you've never checked it out, I highly recommend that you take a look. Also, I um, want to recommend that you improve any compaction issues that you might have. This is new construction, and you can see that the front yard area is not looking so hot with regards to growing plants. So let's call that subsoil. It's also been heavily compacted by machines and things like that. Um, typically, in new construction, the, the, the treatment here would be to throw on some uh, compost on the top and then plant some sod and plant some viburnums and things like that around it, those plants are never really gonna do well because the soil is in, in such terrible shape. So what do we recommend? We recommend trying to dig it in as deeply as you can. If you have really, really compacted soil, um, then a machine is a great way to go about doing that. Um, if you wanna use a tractor to dig in compost, um, call 811 before you dig. The photo here shows basically 18 inches of compost being dug about three feet into the soil. Um, that ratio, sort of like uh, one foot to three, is what you'd want to go for if you're going to use a machine or if you're going to just use tools. It'll be about uh, three inches of compost to every foot or so. But the, the idea is to dig in the organic matter as deeply as you can with the tool that you have available for you. So using machine works great for really, really compacted soil. For your garden, probably not necessary or depending, but here the idea is that spread organic matter over the area. So I'm talking about compost, bagged compost that you purchase at your store. Um, there certainly are higher quality compost than others, but overall, if you dig compost in as deeply as you can, then you plant your plants in that amended soil. They're gonna have a greater probability of quickly becoming established of the, uh, the soil serving as a bit of a, a sponge and holding on for water. And then over time, your plants will become established and be able to scavenge as much water and nutrient as they can from the soil. Also really important to cover the soil. And here we have arborist chips. So when you use mulch, it helps to keep the soil cooler also, that mulch is going to break down over time and uh, contribute to the soil organic matter that we just talked about. The mulch is going to help to keep annual weed seeds from germinating. And the mulch is also going to uh, decrease the impact of rain during the winter and, and erosion and all those kinds of things. So for areas that are uh, permanent beds, highly recommend that you uh, install mulch keep it a little bit away from the base of your plants, cover the bare soil, 
let it break down over time, add additional mulch over time so that you're keeping it, um, the soil surface covered. All right, well, you might be thinking about lawns as well. Lawns also amazingly um, are gonna be contributing a fair amount of carbon to the soil through their roots. And it turns out that the longer the blade of grass, the more proportionally the roots will grow into the soil. So for example, like a typical mowing height is about two inches or so. And if you do that, the, the, the blades will be longer, but also the root mass will be longer too in the soil than if you mow it at one inch. So if you wanna see that a little bit more dramatically, here you go. Um, on the left-hand side, that is, uh, this is a, a turf grass grown in like a, a chamber where you can see the soil and you can see the roots and let's call it about two feet deep. On the left-hand side, the turf grass is mowed at two inches and you can see that the root mass goes down the whole length of the box, box and there's a, a fair amount of roots in there. Uh, at one inch mowing, there's a lot less roots and at the very close cropping of a uh, half an inch mowing, then the uh, uh, there's very little root mass. So the take home message for you is mow your grass a little bit taller. And if you do that, it's going to absorb more carbon, meaning root mass into the soil. And it's also gonna be better at scavenging water and nutrients from the soil. It turns out that with turf grass, the accumulation of carbon in the soil is comparable to regenerating forests and to fallow croplands. So that's a really good thing. Um, you know, it takes a fair amount of work to maintain lawns. We recommend a, a relatively small area, but you should know that, that when you are growing grass, it's actively taking carbon and putting it into the soil. And it, it, our maintenance activities um, are putting carbon emissions into the air. So carbon dioxide, um, if you're using a, a push mower, um, and N2O from the breakdown of fertilizer. So uh, there are ways, if you wanna have a lawn, to minimize your emissions. Uh, I do wanna point out that this information is coming from um, OSU turf grass program. They did a, a study, uh, a meta-analysis on, on soil carbon accumulation in turf grass. And what they saw is that um, carbon accumulates in the soil with turf grass and that the, the maintenance activities are where the emissions come from. And then there's gonna be ways you can minimize the, the emissions from your maintenance activities. And that would first of all be use a push mower. So that's human powered, no, um, Mm, no uh, electricity or no um, fossil fuels required. Uh, and then also uh, there's a lot, lot of really good electric mowing equipment these days. So mowers and weed whackers that are uh, both battery or cord powered, they, they really have improved in the last couple of years. They have enough power to do a pretty good job for your lawn. Another thing I'll point out is that uh, if you're using a mulch mower, and the, right, uh, the red blade on your right-hand side shows a mulching mowing blade. That chops up the grass particles really finely. It helps to return them to the soil right where they're growing. So it's going to help to get that carbon back into the soil. But also, really importantly, it's going to provide uh, a fairly significant amount of nitrogen back to the soil. So all those little grass clippings have a fairly high, like 3% nitrogen or so. When it's chopped up and returned right there to the soil, it's gonna contribute um, one major fertilizer application per year towards your nitrogen needs for your lawn. I also do wanna point out that uh, straight up grass is, is um, sort of the standard that people have in their minds these days with regards to lawns, but it's certainly possible to grow eco lawns, which is deliberately mixing in broadleaf plants with grasses. For example, in this picture, there is ryegrass on the lower part, and up in the top is yarrow mixed with ryegrass. Yarrow is a native plant. It mows really well. It mixes with the grass really nicely. And this photo shows that after five weeks, the yarrow uh, eco lawn is looking a lot greener than the just grass lawn down towards the bottom of it. So they, they take less mowing, 
they survive drought a whole lot better than straight um, turf grass type lawns. <clears throat> okay, moving on a little bit in terms of thinking about plants that you might want to grow, here's where I highly recommend doing research. And the question that folks had earlier, should we be thinking about California native plants? Um, the answer is maybe. Where do you do that research? Highly recommend the Sunset Western Garden Book is really indispensable place to, to look up plant information. I also really love the book called The Right Plant, Right Place. Um, the name kind of says it all. It, it has a, a, lot, a bunch of gardening solutions or different scenarios like um, dry soil and shady areas or wet soil uh, areas and so on. So the more research you do, the better off you'll be in terms of choosing your plants. And then choosing drought tolerant plants. The photo show here shows C. endothis in, um, in excuse me, April or May or so. C. endothis um, grows in Southern Oregon um, into California. And this one here is a large showy evergreen landscapes shrub, very, very drought tolerant. And then it has these incredible blue blossoms at the right time in the spring. A drought tolerant plant is one that after a establishment period will grow and flower without supplemental irrigation. Here's where choosing plants from other Mediterranean regions. So um, the West Coast of the US, the Mediterranean, South Africa, and so on. Those are the kinds of plants that are used to growing um, with the hot, dry summers that we have. The photo here shows cystus or rock rose, very, very drought tolerant, easy to grow kind of shrub. That's um, not gonna need a lot of extra water after it's established. And here's an entire landscape with lots of great drought tolerant plants. The ceanothus is there with blue. There's rock rose with the pink flowers. The gray is perovskia. There's um, flomus, the yellow flowers. There's, there's rosemary. So these plants are well chosen from the Mediterranean and from the west coast of California. I would also recommend avoiding high maintenance plants. Um, just more work, more interventions required. So that would include these prone roses, black spot, rust, and powdery mildew. Um, there are great roses that resist these different diseases, taking out the, the maintenance need for, for handling potential diseases. And then rhododendrons and azaleas, as I mentioned earlier, they used to be sort of a tried and true landscape shrub in the Willamette Valley. It, from what I can tell, many of them are having a very hard time, especially the ones that are drought stressed are gonna be more prone to damage from the azalea lace bug. So the take home message is do your research, figure out what kind of pests might emerge on the plants you wanna grow and choose ones that don't get those problems um, so that you can minimize the maintenance and then all of the work associated with it as well. <clears throat> do want to say just please don't plant invasive plants. Unfortunately, uh, at nurseries, there's still some really terrible plants that are still available, um, ivy, butterfly bush, and so on. There are some sterile varieties, but overall, make sure that the plants that you plant aren't going to spread into wild areas that are right around you. Uh, a great resource for you on that topic topic is called Garden Smart Organ. Uh, it's a guide to non-invasive plants. Let's talk a little bit about irrigation. Um, so irrigation systems are awesome. They really help to get plants established. They also have some disadvantages. So number one, they cost money to install, uh, the cost of the water, and just wondering is it going to go up? And I was just in California this last weekend and the little town where I grew up um, there are water restrictions, so people can't water their lawns or their landscape so much these days. Um, contribute to summer weed issues as well. So those are all disadvantages of irrigation systems. Um, if you don't have a hard plumb irrigation system, what you are going to want to do is make sure that you water for plant establishment. And uh, here are plots at the North Willamette Research and Extension Center. And the idea is that especially if you plant in the fall, that's gonna provide a good long period of time and uh, for the plants to become established. Um, water at this time of year, the 
rains have started. Yay, so happy about that. But if you plant in September, you want to make sure you water every week or so to get the plants well established. The rains should come and, and take care of things really well during the winter time. And then kind of depending next year, come April, May, June, depending on the weather or a particular year, you might want to continue to irrigate newly established plants in their first year or so. Um, they will do better, especially if we have a very, very dry summer like we had this year. I'm a big fan of using, of choosing drought tolerant plants, uh, putting them in the right location, and then using temporary drip irrigation systems to get them established. Um, so just the off the shelf irrigation systems that you can buy at stores, uh, you can ho hook them up to hose bibs and a timer, and that's gonna make it way, way easier to water plants enough to get them established. Saw this picture a couple, uh, uh, took these pictures a couple weeks ago. Um, this is a new development in Washington County and someone spent an awful lot of money on some large, large evergreens here. And they hooked each plant up to one single emitter. And that's just simply not gonna be enough to get plants established. Um, so what I would recommend if you are gonna be planting new trees, to plant, to use like six or eight or even 10 emitters around each one of these trees or use a soaker hose, get around the whole uh, drip zone of the tree and then to water for the first couple of years at least to get drought tolerant trees um, off and running on a good start. The single emitter on the right hand side, simply just not enough for a large tree. Um, I, uh, other strategies, just in terms of adapting for climate change, that is just uh, be ready to go cover your, your sensitive plants during cold weather. So for me, for example, um, I love my citrus and I, I grow in containers. I bring them inside when I know that cold, really cold weather is going to be coming. Um, I know uh, this last year, uh, people were using covers during the, the, the cold period. Also during the heat dome, people were covering their plants to shade them and so on. So uh, the bottom line is, uh, if you know you have plants that are susceptible to cold or to heat, be ready to protect your individual plants as you need during the course of the year. Season extension is a pretty useful tool as well for growing vegetables. It can help to protect from extreme weather like hail, um, it can also uh, provides a measure of protection from pests. This is a site in Southeast Portland where I used to run a vegetable production farm. We sold the produce to a um, local restaurant and through a, a community supported agriculture. The pest pressure there was really rough. We used the row cover fabric here, uh, mostly for pest protection. So under the hoops there, for example, we had brassicas like broccoli under the flat areas we had carrots. The goal was to protect the plants from imported cabbage moth, um, from flea beetles, and so on. So with the row cover fabric, um, it's going to help to buffer extreme temperatures, and it's going to help to protect your pests and also protect them from cold weather and uh, weather events. A bummer about row cover fabric is that the slugs will equally enjoy living underneath the, the cover. It's a little bit warmer, it's a little bit more humid. So you have to be really rigorous about checking underneath and making sure that the slugs aren't gonna destroy your plants. Um, my colleague, Brooke Edmonds, came up with an article that came out a couple of weeks ago called Top Tips for Gardeners to Help Fight Climate Change. Here's a couple of things I haven't talked about yet that I wanna mention for you. And that is uh, when you're buying equipment, get used tools and equipment. So there, there's less embodied energy, um, doesn't take the new energy to create brand new tools. Um, minimize your use of single use plastics. So that would be uh, like containers, that would be the row cover fabric that I just mentioned, um, et cetera. And then recycle food scraps and garden waste through composting. The photo here shows um, worm composting. If you're gonna compost food scraps, highly recommend you do it um, in a worm bin that's closed off and that rats and other uh, wildlife can't get into. 
A couple more uh, points, top tips for gardeners to help fight climate change. I already talked about human powered or electric powered equipment. So that's your lawn equipment, et cetera. And then uh, peat moss. Peat moss is mined from Northern areas like Canada. They scrape peat, which is a, a naturally boggy area that has a lot of carbon. Um, and so it, it, den it denudes the area. It uh, ships that material here, and then people add it to their gardens to, um, to add organic matter or to help to acidify soil for planting blueberries and things like that. So I would say where you can avoid using peat-based or um, products or peat-based soil mixes, um, mining peat is really bad news for Arctic areas. Want to mention just a couple more uh, things that OSU has going regarding climate change research and extension at this point in time, solve pest problems and the OSU dry farming program. With solve pest problems, the idea is that right now we don't have a super handy way for people to research uh, various kinds of pests like animals, diseases, insects, and weeds. And stakeholders here uh, across the state in the Portland area have come to us and asked for. Um, a, a clear and concise way to help people make informed decisions. Uh, we think that this is forward thinking in that if we know that pests are going to get worse, so weeds and insects, et cetera, then it really uh, would be great to get information out to people so that they can make informed decisions about insect pests, weeds in the middle of the Japanese beetle, um, yellow jackets we've seen pretty bad the last number of years. And then I already talked about weeds. The purpose of solved pest problems is to reduce the impacts of pests and pest management practices on people and the environment in non-agricultural settings. That's really the key point there is that um, we're not talking about agriculture. We're talking about the, the area that you're managing in your yard. We're talking about um, residential commercial landscape areas, preschools, other locations. And that we want to help to address inequities and in access to unbiased science-based pest management information. So lots of different uh, organizations and agencies have empowered us to uh, initially research and, and build out the service. We hope to launch the first wave of content or so in 2022. I'm grateful for all those sponsors who believed in me as project manager to uh, help bring this project to fruition. Again, really it's, it's forward thinking. We're thinking that with climate change, we know people are gonna experience more pest problems. We want them to have information. The audience groups, it's you. It's do DIY urban, excuse me, DYI urban and, and rural residents. It's landscape professionals, nursery workers, OSU master gardeners and master naturalists, communities historically underserved by OSU, and really anyone in the Western US looking for reliable pest management info. An example topic, tree of heaven, who has Tree of Heaven on their property? It's not an easy one to handle. And then as well, OSU is working on, uh, Department of Horticulture colleagues have the Dry Farming Collaborative. So if you're really interested in vegetable gardening and adapting to climate change, highly recommend checking out OSU's Dry Farming Group. So specific soil preparation techniques, specific varieties, and then specific uh, maintenance along the way, you can grow great crops without supplemental irrigation. You're going to have to adjust your expectations and get really specific details from the OSU dry farming group. Here's a little review. We've talked about the historical climate of the, uh, the Pacific Northwest, that the evidence for climate change is clear. We've seen a lot of evidence in that of climate change affecting our region in recent years. Uh, what, what should we expect? Increased incidence of uh, extreme weather, so hots, colds, et cetera. There are definitely things that you can do, starting with building soil, organic matter, and choosing plants wisely and getting them established, et cetera. So now's the time I can take some more questions, Heather. Sure, we're a couple minutes over, so I'm gonna maybe just do a couple here um, before I sign off and, and do my closing statement. Okay. But we've had a number of questions about 
additives to the soil, whether it be polymers or um, mycorrhizae or biochar um, to help, mm. especially because you mentioned um, the problems with using peat. And I think core was mentioned sure. as well in one of the questions. Would you be able to talk a little bit about soil additives for moisture retention and if you recommend them? Sure. Yeah. Overall, I'd recommend that people add compost or uh, well decomposed leaves to the soil. Don't recommend the polymers or don't recommend any other products. Really, what you're trying to do is feed, feed the soil microbes. What they like most is, is compost. That's their fuel. Perfect. Um, do you have anything? You, there's a couple of questions, too, about food. Um, are there any reliable food plants that would be resilient? And orchards were brought up in one of the questions as well. Sure. With food crops, um, I think it's a matter of doing your research. Um, apples have pretty wide range of temperatures that they're really accustomed to. Um, I would avoid, uh, at least in the Willamette Valley, I would avoid um, cherries and uh, peaches and whatnot, just mostly because they're really pretty hard to grow. Um, but for me personally, I'm starting to um, grow things that I used to grow in the central coast of California, like pineapple guava and citrus and kind of crossing my fingers that I'll be able to grow some new things. Um, but those aren't reliable, let's say, um, with vegetable crops, it would be your staples like, like beans and things that have been grown in the southwest of the United States for, um, for millennia with indigenous societies. All right, perfect. Thank you, Weston. So I think that's about all the questions that we can take at this time, um, since we're running a little bit over. So I really want to thank you, Weston, for your time and thank everyone for attending today. Um, there's an evaluation link for, um, for Weston in the chat box. And then um, also there's going to be an evaluation for the Level Up program that um, will appear as you close your Zoom webinar. Um, if you did not get your question answered today, which I know there's still a few left, please reach out to your local extension office, or you can also use Ask an Expert to have your question answered. If you are an Oregon Master Gardener volunteer, you can receive continuing education for attendance at today's session. Um, you can track your and submit your time through the guidance of your county coordinator. We also have approval for one Oregon Landscape Contractors Board credit for watching the webinar, so please contact me, Heather Stoven. Um, if you would like to receive credit. Um, and lastly, our last webinar is next month. And so it's going to be, um, let me see, oh, Healthy Soils for Healthy People. So that'll be on November 9th. So please attend our last webinar of the year um, and the whole schedule for the um, Level Up series and then the recordings are gonna be on our Level Up website. So we hope to see you at the uh, future session. In the meantime, happy gardening. Thanks everyone, take care. Yeah, thank you very much, Weston. <laughs>